webinar. So we'll just get started. Al, as usual, can I trouble you to welcome everyone on behalf of Gizmo? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm the president uh, of Gizmo, Al, Alan Leitner, and uh, happy you are all here. And this is just one in a continuing series of um, talks and uh, meetings that uh, Gizmo puts on for its membership and for people who are not members, but maybe aspiring members. And uh, this has been a very busy summer for all of us. Uh, I think uh, it'd be fair to say that GIS is advancing uh, across the country and even around the world from, from my vantage point. So, um, you know, I would say if you're not a member of Gizmo, join because things are happening and you're going to want to be part of them. And um, otherwise, uh, please enjoy this meeting and uh, what you'll learn from it. And, um, and I'll hand it back to you, Jen and Amy, who have been absolutely critical in, in putting these programs on. Well, thank you, Al. Uh, welcome, everyone. Again, my name is Jen Wen. And Amy, Ju, and I are delighted to be your technical host uh, for today's tonight's prep. We call it present, present chatation. And um, the theme is always on point, and we thank Dr. Juliana Mante for pulling, pulling this uh, distinguished panel together. Thank you, Greg, Deborah, and Frank, and um, uh, Juliana will do the introduction. But uh, before that, I'd like to introduce Juliana Mante <laughs> as the moderator for today's panel. Juliana is a director and founder of the GISC program at Lehman College since 1998. She has been developing and teaching courses such as environmental modeling, spatial analysis of urban health, historical and cultural GISC, and research methods. Her main research interests are environmental justice, risk assessment, health disparities, and participatory GIS, all subjects we just love dearly. Prior to her academic career, Professor Mante worked for 25 years in architecture, urban planning, and environmental management and policy, and has degrees from Cornell University, NYU, Hunter College, and Rutgers University. With that, I turn the program over to you. Okay, thanks, Jen. Uh, greetings, everyone, once again, and welcome to Gizmo Celebration of World Population Day. Uh, as has been mentioned, we have three very distinguished speakers with us tonight. But before I introduce them, I wanna just start by making a few remarks about World Population Day itself and why, uh, why it's commemorated every year. So in 1987, the United Nations estimated that the earth would reach the uh, 5 billion population milestone on July 11th of that year. This was called the 5 billion day and it actually sparked massive public interest in population issues. Then in 2000, the global population reached 6 billion, and by 2011, it reached the 7 billion mark, and today it stands at about 7.8 billion, and is expected to grow to 10 billion by 2057, which doubles uh, from the 1987 5 billion day in just 70 years. So because of the widespread interest in the 5 billion day back in 1987, the UN Governing Council of Development Programs created World Population Day in 1989 as a kind of an annual holiday to focus the public's attention on the urgency and importance of population issues, including the significance to the environment and development, and specifically highlighting the challenges of overpopulation and its ramifications on human health and the environment. And these population issues, of course, have only become more acute um, and urgent with the general recognition of the human and environmental costs of the climate crisis. So the, the, the study of, uh, of, of population issues uh, really potentially touches almost every discipline. So obviously, in addition to demographers, uh, we have geographers, GIS analysts, environmental scientists, urban planners, urbanists, public health experts, and basically just about all types of uh, social scientists and many natural scientists as well. And we all study different aspects of population. And for this, we need data. And in fact, data, of course, was a big um, uh, 
reason or you know initiator of how the United Nations is able to do these estimates. So uh, you know we use demographic methods and data in much of our research and advocacy work, and we depend on the accurate accounting of population and subpopulation numbers and their associated uh, socioeconomic indicators in doing our work to measure and assess and and combat the impacts of the climate crisis, environmental injustices, health inequities, uh, and in general to promote the rights of people globally. So therefore population data is really the key to much of this work that we do and proper understanding and analysis of the data is crucial. So uh, we, we're gonna move on to our three distinguished speakers who are uh, Gregory Hanks, Frank Donnelly and Deborah Balk, and they're going to illustrate some of these challenges and benefits of working with population data. So I'll start by introducing our first speaker, uh, Gregory Hanks. And by the way, um, if you have questions, um, we're going to try to hold all questions to the end. Whenever when all three speakers get done, you can in the meanwhile put your questions in the chat. And if you don't want to put them in the chat, you can just ask them at the end uh, verbally. Okay, so Gregory Hanks is the Deputy Chief of the Census Bureau's Geography Division. Greg has over 20 years of experience at the Census Bureau, leading efforts in geographic data collection and processing, developing national and local partnerships, as well as portfolio and program management. He serves as the coordinator of the Census Bureau's Enterprise Partnership with the United States Postal Service and as executive champion, I like that word, executive champion, for the um, Puerto Rico Address Data Working Group. Greg studied cartography and geography at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County and program management at the George Washington University. And the title of his talk is Geospatial Highlights from the 2020 census and where next in vision. Okay, take it away, Greg. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you, Alan and Gizmo for the opportunity to uh, speak as part of tonight's World Population Day celebration. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Audio is good. Okay, how about my presentation? Is it showing on the screen? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Yes. So Juliana said, my name is Greg Hanks and I'm the deputy chief of the geography division at the Census Bureau. I'm, just, I'm gonna go off camera, uh, link one camera just real quick to say hi. I'm not gonna stay on because I need to do double monitors uh, to do my notes. So I'm gonna offer tonight just a few geospatial highlights from the 2020 census uh, and also some insights into where geography at the Census Bureau is headed this next decade. So to set the stage for any discussion about the census, it's important to revisit why the people of the United States invest in and conduct this massive civic exercise every 10 years. The answer is in our constitution, which directs the government to conduct a census of population and housing every 10 years, and then disseminate the results of that census to the president, the states, and the American people. The uses of census data are many, but the original and most important use is to apportion congressional representation among the states as mandated by Article 1, Section 2. Following redistricting and reapportionment, the next major role for census data is the distribution of more than $675 billion annually in federal funding to tribes, states, and local communities and organizations. So I'm focusing on the geospatial aspects of the census tonight, and that's not hard to do. Geography provides the foundation for all data collection, processing, tabulation, and dissemination activities conducted at the Bureau. With limited time today, I'm gonna to highlight some of the most vivid examples of this from the 2020 census. On this slide, we show a few examples of the technology used by the Bureau at different points in the census life cycle, starting with establishing where to count where GIS applications were key, then conducting our enumeration that relied heavily on workload management and live time reporting, and finally tabulating and disseminating our results, a stage where advanced mapping tools really bring the data to life. So the first step in preparing for the 2020 census is building or was building a national address list and geospatial database that established where to count all of the people residing in the United States. To get this address list built, we worked with authoritative partners in tribal, federal, state, and local government to enhance information we had already collected during the 2010 census. 
Our primary source of address updates routinely come from the United States Postal Service. Twice per year, they share their address list with us, the one that they use to deliver the mail. It's called a delivery sequence file. Using this file, we added 5.9 million new addresses to our own master address file between the years 2010 and 2019. Uh, in addition, we have an ongoing partnership programs with tribal, state, and local governments where over the course of the past decade, they shared nearly 107 million addresses uh, with the Census Bureau. When matched to the master address file, so our address list, an astounding 99.5% of those addresses matched to an existing record. In 2018, the Bureau implemented the Local Update of Census Addresses Program, or LUCA, that again provides tribal, state, and local government with an opportunity to actually review and update the Bureau's live address list for their respective jurisdictions. We have participants from over 8,300 jurisdictions nationwide provide 22 million addresses, of which 81%, again, giving us great confidence, match to addresses we already had. And to enable tribal, state, and local governments one final opportunity to, to submit addresses where new construction was completed directly before the census, we conducted a new construction program uh, in, the, in the year 2019 that added about another 600,000 new addresses to our roles. So all these steps together provided us confidence in the completeness of our master address file and also the consistency that exists between these various data sources when it comes to building a frame for conducting the census. So working with our partners early in the decade set us up for the next address list development activity, something we call address canvassing or the address canvassing operation. So the design of this 2020 version was much different than what was done in the past. In 2009, in preparation for the 2010 census, the Bureau hired approximately 150,000 address listers who walked every block coast to coast to validate 100% of the nation's addresses in the field during a massive and expensive operation. So in preparation for 2020, we knew and we were confident that much of this validation of our address list could be done in the office using advanced GIS technology and satellite imagery in combination with housing unit counts from the address file we already had. So to make this happen, we developed a fairly innovative approach to this called in-office address canvassing. Nice, easy to understand name. So using only 150 technicians, we conducted a complete eyes on GIS review of all 11.1 million census blocks across the nation, asking those technicians to flag areas that exhibited signs of growth, change, or new use. So the, the technicians validated 87% of the blocks across the nation as passive or exhibiting no growth, meaning there was no obvious difference between the number of housing units viewed in current imagery as compared with archival imagery uh, from 2009. So the 87% of the blocks that were designated as passive during our in-office address canvassing operation represented 65% of the nation's addresses. Dark blue areas on this map represent counties that had over 70% of their blocks classified as passive or stable, and some patterns obviously jump out at you about where that's happening. The Bureau recognizes that this kind of change detection technique is not foolproof and also relied on supplemental sources such as the Postal Service's information and local uh, addresses provided by tribal, state, and local addresses, uh, governments to give us more confidence that we had reliably identified where changes in housing were occurring on the ground. So the remaining 35% of addresses that were tagged in areas exhibiting change were sent for validation in the field in an operation appropriately called in-field address canvassing uh, in the summer of 2019. So we hired 32,000 address listers to do this work, again, in comparison to 150,000 the decade before. And what we found were that 88.2% of addresses were validated as correct. The remainder that needed editing or deleting were done, uh, the work was conducted in the field. So our address listers added 2.7 million new addresses from field work that we didn't have through, through those early processes. But when we matched those 2.7 million against our master address file, we found that 67% matched something we already had. So all these excellent and encouraging results supported the hypothesis that automation and change detection techniques together could combine with smaller field operations to ensure a national address list that was current, accurate, and a lot less expensive to build than historical methods. So to illustrate this concept on the map, uh, we have uh, representing counties that had the, the dark green, I'm sorry, represent counties that had over 50% of their blocks classified as active or changing and therefore requiring in-field validation. Again, the patterns that could jump out at you, uh, you can see for yourself. Uh, these combined activities resulted in a $185 million cost avoidance uh, for the Bureau during the 2020 census cycle. 
So when the address list development activities were completed, we've, we delivered a final universe of 152 million addresses that composed the 2020 census enumeration universe. 95% of those received an invitation, and many of you, I'm sure, uh, on the call tonight to participate in the census via the mail, the postal mail, and the remaining 5% nationwide were hand-delivered an invitation and or the enumeration interview was conducted at their front door. So where do we go next? So moving forward into this new decade, our program vision enables continuous updates that build upon our accomplishments of the past decades. Our vision focuses on people, process, and technology. As we look ahead to the 2030 census, hard to think about that, but it's true, we plan to optimize our workforce of professional geographers so they can focus on strategic initiatives that continuously update our master address file and geospatial database. We aspire to validate 90% of all residential addresses in the office using authoritative data from public and commercial sources, as well as learning more about how the public can contribute to this process in a crowdsourcing mechanism. We, we aim to elevate the functionality of technology that is both used in the office and in the field, hopefully reducing the cost of custom engineering along the way. We're organizing our future program vision with six cornerstones shown here on the slide, addresses, features, uh, boundaries, imagery, partnerships, and expertise and leadership. The next few slides will give you just a few details about each of these cornerstones for our future program. Our first cornerstone is addresses. In some areas, we're going to stick with what we know works, our partnership with the Postal Service and from our partners in tribal, state, and local government where it makes sense. We've already started a continual in-office address canvassing operation that is reviewing areas of the country that have already been identified as experiencing change as compared to 2020 and making ongoing updates as appropriate. Instead of concentrating only on residential housing, as we've done in the past, we'll now enhance our focus to continual, of continual maintenance to include non-residential addresses, institutional and group living quarters, think colleges and nursing homes, for example, military housing, and transit residential locations like campgrounds and marinas. We will also maintain a list of addresses in the island, United States island area territories. So these last couple of examples are addresses we have, but we don't typically maintain them through the course of a decade. That will change moving forward. As uh, Julietta mentioned, uh, in which she introduced me, over the past two years, the Bureau has been leading the work of the Puerto Rico Address Data Working Group in an effort to improve address and geolocation data for the island of Puerto Rico. So working with local government and other federal agencies, we have issued three reports that identify challenges, opportunities, and recommendations for next steps that we are committed to supporting from the Bureau moving forward. Our second uh, cornerstone is features. Uh, here too, we will stick with what we know works, such as continuing to regularly uh, acquire feature data, such as roads, highways, and railroads from authoritative sources. While we, and while we feel confident about the representation and spatial quality of road features in our database, we intend to implement more frequent updates and improve the quality of non-road features, such as hydrography within our system products and services. Our third cornerstone is boundaries. We plan to continue our national boundary and annexation survey on an annual basis. This will ensure we have the most up-to-date legal boundaries in our database, which is critical for the accurate collection and dissemination of statistics, and also for sharing updated boundaries with the public as part of our regularly released suite of products and services. As part of our vision for the future, we will research the possibility of in, what we call intersensual or between census updates to our statistical geographic areas, such as census tracts and blocks groups. And if you know this type of geography, you know we only update it once per decade. We will also assess the need to add new types of geographic areas to our inventory. Uh, this will make you happy, uh, Deborah and Frank. Uh, this includes the possibility of grid data uh, to be able to develop and share comparable data sets across nations. Uh, this is increasingly important as we tackle issues like pandemics and climate change on a global scale. Our fourth cornerstone is imagery. Our partnership with the United States, uh, um, yeah, the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture's National Agricultural Imagery Program and the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency were two of the greatest factors contributing to the success of our re-engineered 2020 census design. Access to their free satellite imagery in near real time enabled the implementation of our in-office address canvassing operation. So we intend to maintain these important relationships uh, and continue to use both satellite and aerial imagery to help facilitate change detection uh, across our uh, various lines of business. Our fifth cornerstone is partnership. Maintaining our partner relationships with partners in tribal, federal, state, and local government is central to our vision and its success. We do need to explore mechanisms for more effective and efficient sharing of data amongst our partners, and that is on our list to research and implement in the future. 
And our sixth and final cornerstone is expertise and leadership. We will continue to participate in national and international forums to further our work and the nation's work in geography, cartography, data science, and geographic information systems. So where does this work on these six cornerstones take us? To the Bureau's Geographic Support Program of the Future, a program that features uh, using the best data sources and methods to continuously update our portfolio of data assets, enhancing our master address file to be a compendium of all addresses, residential, non-residential, and mixed use, strengthening partnerships at all levels of government, as well as with other sectors and organizations, and finally, conducting ongoing assessments of the utility and relevance of our work using data science methods. So in summary, our vision, again, very, very rapidly presented, uh, is to continuously update our network of addresses, boundaries, and features to create an integrated geospatial system that may be linked to other frames of information within and across the Census Bureau. This, in turn, will result in modernized methods and new and enhanced data products and services across our organization, all in turn feeding the federal government and the public with timely, relevant, and accurate geographic and statistical data. So that's it for me. Uh, thanks for, uh, again, the chance to present a very fast uh, intro to the, the, the accomplishments of the 2020 census, and also uh, a quick look at where we hope to go as a program moving into the next decade. So as Juliana said, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions uh, that we have um, when appropriate uh, here in the program. Thanks again for um, the chance to participate. Thank you, Gregory. That was very, very interesting and um, informative. And I have a million questions. So when we get to that point, um, be prepared. Uh, Sounds good. Yeah. Okay, so next we're going to hear from Frank Donnelly. He is the GIS and data librarian at Brown University in Rhode Island. <clears throat> he was previously the geospatial data librarian at Baruch College, uh, City University of New York, and taught courses in spatial databases in the GIS program at Lehman College, which is where I am. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. He's an affiliate of the CUNY Institute for Demographic Research, and his book, Exploring the U.S. Census, Your Guide to America's Data, was published by SAGE in 2020. The title of his talk is Geographic Population Data, Sources and Tips. All right, there I am unmuted and let's see if we can get the screen up. So can we hear and see me? Yes. Cool. Yeah. All right, so it's great to be back here at Gizmo again and to see a lot of familiar faces. So again, my name is Frank Donnelly. Uh, I'm the recent GIS and data librarian at Brown. I was previously at CUNY with everybody for many years. And as a librarian, I spend a lot of time helping people locate and assess uh, population data sets for the research that they're, that they're doing. So I thought what we would do here is talk about, you know, some, some of my favorite sources, I guess, for, for geographic population data. And then in talking about some of those sources, also giving you some tips for navigating those sites so that you can really dig in there and find what you need. All the resources that I'm going to share with you tonight are free and publicly available. Uh, in a few cases for things that are hard to find, I put links on the slides. But in most cases, you'll be able to Google any of these things or use your favorite search engine and you'll be able to get right to them. So I've just basically split my talk into two. We'll talk about the US of A first, uh, and then we'll look at the rest of the globe and see where we can find some data sets there. So I won't talk as much since, you know, Greg is here from the Census Bureau and gave us a, a good introduction to the, you know, the geography program there. But in essence, if you're looking for population data in the United States, data.census.gov is the place that most people will start. Uh, it's replaced the American Fact Finder, which is the older portal. And generally speaking, if you're looking just to get some basic profiles, if you wanna get a lot of population data about a single place, then you can come here, plug that into the search box uh, and then find what you're looking for. But if you're looking to do, you know, to grab larger data sets where I need all the counties in the United States or I need all the census tracts in New York, then your better bet is to go below here and hit that advanced search. And then what you could do through the advanced search is that you can basically apply a series of filters to narrow all of this population data down very specifically to what you're looking for. Because this search engine is crawling across 
I don't know, 20 or 30 different data sets, you know, literally millions and millions of records. Instead of searching across that, it's easier to kind of filter and limit uh, the data sets that you're looking for so that you can browse through them more easily. And essentially what you can do in narrowing things down is that you can choose a data set, choose a specific time frame that you want, look at, pick your geography out, and then start to look at specific topics and subjects. And then you'll have a more manageable list of tables that you can sort through uh, for looking for population data. For those who are more, um, I guess, uh, savvy with technology or you are scripting or a programming type person, if you don't want to use the GUI, the Census Bureau also exposes most of their data sets through an API. So you can write a little script like this one in Python where you have these links and every single census data set has its own API page that gives you kind of the breakdown of how that data is organized there. And you can basically in your program, you build a series of links where you pass in variables that indicate the year and the data source uh, and then the specific geography that you're looking for. And basically you can pull out that population data within a program. And then you can either use that data in a program right away to make graphs or charts or to do a little bit of analysis, or you could basically just spit it out into like a CSV file and then take that information somewhere else. So this is a Python script and basically just defining your variables up here and passing them in and building these URLs and just grabbing the data here. Just in a very short program, you're able to reach out and, and grab data sets like this. In this case, population estimates uh, for the different counties in Rhode Island. But whether you take the GUI approach of searching and browsing for things, or you decide to write a program, uh, in order to do this, that, you know, the programming isn't that tough if you're familiar with it, but the tougher part is understanding how the census data is organized. You really need to have some knowledge of that in order to really navigate it. So one of the first decisions you really have to make is what data set do you want to look at? There are a lot of different data sets. I think of these as kind of the big three uh, geographic summary population data sets. And what you're looking at here is that if you're interested in getting like precise statistics that represent 100% count of the population, and you're looking for just basic demographic characteristics like age, sex, race, the number of housing units, how people are related to one another, then the 10 year census or the decennial census is uh, the place that you would look. Also a good place to look if you're doing any kind of historical analysis. On the other hand, if you want annually updated data and you're looking for detailed socioeconomic characteristics of the population, things like income and language and journey to work and things like that, all of that information is captured in the American Community Survey, which is an ongoing sample survey that captures these characteristics. And the data is published annually as one year estimates for really big parts of the country with 65,000 people or more, or as five year estimates down to the block group level. Or lastly, uh, there's also the population estimates program, which is a bit different. It uses basically the cohort component method in demography. It takes births, deaths, and migration and creates an estimate every single year uh, for the total population, sex, age, and race for large geographic areas in the United States. So if you wanted something that's less fuzzy than the American Community Survey, because these are estimates with margins of error, and you're looking at big places, uh, then the population estimates is, is an option. So right off the bat, by choosing the specific data set based on your intended use, you can narrow what you're looking through quite a bit. And then of course, the other thing that you'll wanna look, that you'll use to narrow things down is what geography are you interested in looking in? So uh, there's, there's a whole hierarchy of geographies that the Census Bureau publishes data for. Uh, there are legal geographies, like the ones that you see here at the top. The legal areas are places that exist, you know, as a matter of fact, you know, they have defined boundaries and some kind of legal mandate, or there's also a variety of statistical areas which are created essentially for publishing population data uh, so that you can study it for, for small places. So choosing your data set, choosing your geography, and that'll, those are really your big decisions for getting contemporary data. If you need to go back in time, then there are other places that you would go and other considerations that you have to keep in mind. So. If I want to get the census data from 1990 or from 1860 or any other point up to the beginning of the first census, then you could check out the NHGIS, which is one of many um, portals that's created by the, the Population Center at the University of Minnesota. The NHGIS is really intended to be an archive of all of the summary census data that was ever produced. 
So you do have to create an account in order to use it, but it's free to use. And you go there and essentially you have the same kinds of filters that you apply. You choose your geography, the year, the topic, and then the data set that you're looking for. And then you're able to download data from that census. Tricky thing about you know, going back in the past is that the questions have changed and also the geography changes over time. So most of the data in here is what we call nominal data and that it is published just the way that it was published when it was originally published. Um, but in some cases, particularly for more recent data from 1990 forward, the NHGIS also provides um, normalized data. So this is data where the data from the past has been basically reformulated to fit the boundaries of the present so that you can make ready geographic comparison over time. And typically normalized data would be published at the county level and at the census tract level, as these are areas that are meant to be relatively consistent. I mean, these boundaries do change uh, every 10 years, but they are more consistent than some of the other geographies. Uh, so this IPOMS and NHGIS is really the place to go for historical data. Uh, there's also, I don't have a slide for it, but the longitudinal tract database, uh, which is produced at Brown University, is another source that you can go to get normalized data uh, so that the data fits within current geography, I think back to the 1970 census. Not only does the NHGIS provide the population data, but they also provide GIS boundary files so that you can get the boundaries of the census tracts back in 1970 or the boundaries of the counties back in uh, you know, 1870 or whatever you need. The boundary files, of course, are uh, the, tiger, the tiger files and the census publishes a few different iterations of these. The actual tiger line files uh, represent the precise legal and statistical boundaries of each area. So Michigan looks like a giant blob because its legal boundaries extend into the middle of the Great Lakes. But then uh, the census also publishes a number of these cartographic boundary files where the line work has been generalized to remove like large bodies of coastal water and also to kind of simplify the line work. And these boundary files are really more suitable if you're trying to make a thematic map of population. If you go to this link at the bottom, uh, you'll basically get to a page where you can get to the tiger line files, to the cartographic boundary files, and to another, a number of other derivative products that the Census Bureau creates um, for representing data spatially. And as GIS, as most of you, I think, are GIS users, as we know, this is a two-step process where you get the population data or the attribute data that you want as a table, and then you get the boundary files uh, where those areas represent the same records that you have in that table. And then you can bring them into GIS and join them based on an identifying column that they have in, column, in, in common uh, so that you can then map all of the data that's in that table. And all of the Census Bureau's uh, shape files and also their data tables are gonna have uh, the ANSI FIPS codes uh, that can be used for uniquely identifying each place and then linking the things, linking the data tables to the spatial layers. Uh, that's really the shortest census <laughs> presentation that I could give. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more about the census, uh, I have this research guide that I created at Brown. Uh, I would, you're welcome to go there and check it out. There are a lot of resources that you can take a look, not only for getting data, but for also learning a, little, a lot more about the census and how to navigate. But what about the rest of the world? This is World Population Day after all, so where are we gonna get global population data? If you're looking for country level data, there are a lot of sources for that. You can go to the Population Reference Bureau, you can go to the World Bank. Uh, and of course, the UN data page is probably the, the place that I go to most often. They also have a search box. This one works pretty well. You can basically put in a variable that you're looking for and get some results. But on the right-hand side of the search box, there is a little bit, there's this more button uh, and the librarian's favorite tool is always this little advanced search option. If you go to the advanced search from that tool, then you'll get a screen that looks like this at the bottom and it will break down all of the sources because this page includes all of the different agencies and departments and initiatives at the UN that produce data. So if you actually wanna look at this at the source level, if you go to the advanced search, then you can see the Comtrade information or specifically the demographic information from the statistics division uh, and then you can narrow things down here a little bit more and even then narrow it down by country or by year. Once you pull up a table uh, on UN data, you'll get something like this. Uh, so you can filter it down by year or by country. Uh, in this case, we're looking at, uh, what is this? Population data by sex. 
uh, for all the different countries for different years. Another tip is that at the top of this page, there'll often be these other little uh, options that you can take a look at. One of the ones that you definitely have to use is this option that says select columns. If you intend to take this population data and map any of it and join it to a boundary file, you need to have some unique ID codes. So for the globe, the ISO country codes, which are a series of codes that are either alpha or numeric codes are commonly used to identify places. If you choose the select columns option, then you'll be able to actually add those country codes into your table so that when you download it, you'll have a unique identifier that you can use. It's not visible on this particular table, but in some cases you'll also get a link to pivot the table because of course in GIS, we need the records to represent places. In this case, the records, records represent a place for a particular year for a particular indicator. What the pivot tool will allow you to do is take some of these um, values here and move them up as columns so that you'll, have, you'll be left with records for individual places and then you'll have columns for, in this case, male and female on both sexes instead of having them listed here as individual indicators. So UN data page is a great place to go. It's pretty comprehensive if you're looking for population data for countries. The tougher part is getting population data around the world below the country level. So you need what the equivalent of states or provinces or counties are in other countries. If you're working within a specific country, you can go directly to the statistical agency for that country and see what's available. And the folks at the US Census Bureau have helpfully put together this page that lists every single statistical agency so that you can get a link and you can go right there. The challenge is that, you know, in the US here, we're a bit spoiled and that we have all of this free public domain and comprehensive data. Uh, but in other countries, the census data may be copyrighted in whole or in part. Uh, in other places, it may not be published. Some countries don't publish the census. Uh, and if you go to these pages, in some cases, you may need to know the native language in order to navigate that, that website. So it can be a, hit, a bit hit or miss. And if you're trying to get all of the areas for the world at once, then obviously this is going to be kind of a tough sell. This is really for finding data for that one specific country that you're studying. This global data lab uh, is a bit of a hidden gem. It is the easiest place that I have ever found <laughs> where you can go and get um, subnational population data for all countries at once. So if you want to get the state or province data for every single country in the world, you can go to this global data lab. They really specialize in publishing these different human development indices, but there's a category and an indicator option here where instead of looking at those indexes, you can look at the actual indicators that are used to create that index. So for example, in this case, the total population size, and here we can see at the top uh, these are all the different administrative divisions of Afghanistan, and then it goes all the way down to the bottom for, you know, um, Zimbabwe. So easiest place that I've ever seen to get all subnational data um, in one place. You do have to log in, but this is another free resource that you can use and access for that. There's also that the IPUMS project has another module called IPUMS Terra, where they have taken a lot of the detailed census data from different countries and have knitted it together in this platform so that you can download a lot of it at once. So you can log in, choose your countries. The censuses are all gonna be different, you know, based on when the country actually conducts it. But this is another possible place where you can go to grab um, data for many countries at the same time for levels that are below the national level. If you have to go back in time, there's this project called the Madison Project. Yes, it's not misspelled, it's Madison with two Ds. Uh, this is at the University of Groningen in uh, the Netherlands. And basically you wanna go back in time, you know, in some cases to the year one <laughs> and see what the population and even the GDP was in different countries. So this is basically a spreadsheet. And when you download it, you can see here, I have a portion of India um, and for recent years, and then once we get to the next in the eyes, we have Ireland. Not all of the information is available for all countries for all years, but this is information that's derived in modern times from statistics, but in older times from basically calling through a lot of old literature and grabbing data and making inferences about what the population was at that period of time. That is the data itself. Again, you have to find some boundary files to go with that data if you want to make maps. A nice site to go to if you're just doing, you know, you want to make nice cartography is the Natural Earth. 
They provide boundaries for the countries, for the subdivisions of countries. Uh, and then there are a lot of different vector and some raster features to give you rivers and cities and other things. So, and these vector files come with the ISO country codes. So if you download some population data from the UN and download these boundary files, you should be able to bring them together. The natural earth files are designed for cartography. So they are, the line work is smooth and generalized. If you needed boundaries that were more precise and you were just interested in those administrative divisions, then this, uh, this GADM <laughs> site uh, is a place to go where I need to get every administrative division in Argentina, for example. The boundaries are not always perfect, um, and, but for many applications, they would be pretty suitable and you can download them in a number of different formats. Uh, lastly, a different way of thinking about global population data, instead of looking at the actual censuses that are taken and the administrative or statistical areas for which they're gathered, another way of looking at this is to look at gridded population data where you have the earth basically divided as a raster layer with individual cells and the raster was generated either by taking that administrative data that is for these little boundaries that are all over the place and kind of harmonizing it into little grid cells or in some cases using things like the nighttime lights database to estimate what the population of the area would be. Um, so this is an alternative uh, to doing that kind of studying population. I don't know as much, I don't work with this information as much, uh, but luckily Deborah is the next speaker and she works with this all the time. Uh, so maybe she can explain it a little bit more, but I'm running up against the end of the time here. So there you go. I hope you learned a few useful tips and there's my contact information and you're always welcome to reach out to me and follow up. And of course, we'll take questions at the end. Okay, great. Thanks, Frank. That was that was a very interesting and um, I think very revelatory to, to many people about all the different data sources that are really out there, but maybe a little bit hidden from the average uh, average soul. Okay, so next up is Deborah Balk, who's a professor of public affairs in the Mark School of Public and International Affairs at Brew College at CUNY. She's also a professor of, uh, in economics and sociology PhD programs at the CUNY Grad Center and in the epidemiology and biostatistics department at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health. She is the interim director of the CUNY Institute of Demographic Research and is a leading expert in spatial demography um, and her research combines demographic and spatial frameworks using traditional social science data with satellite data to examine urbanization and related uh, demographic behaviors such as migration and health outcomes with respect to environmental factors, in particular climate change. She's led interdisciplinary research projects on urbanization and global population modeling and has produced publicly available data sets such as the Global Rural Urban Mapping Project or GRUMP data and low elevation coastal zone data. She currently serves as a member on the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Population and on the US Census Scientific Advisory Committee and is a co-chair of the New York City Planning on Climate Change fourth assessment. Dr. Ball calls an MPP in public policy from the University of Michigan and PhD in demography from the University of California, Berkeley. The title of her talk is Urbanization and Population Change in Low Elevation Coastal Zones at Risk of Coastal Hazards. Thank you, Juliana, for the introduction and for having me. Um, and I'm happy to be following uh, Frank and Greg um, who told us quite a bit about censuses and access to census resources. What I will talk about is putting some of those, I'm a user of those data rather than a creator of those data in particular. And I take those data and do things with them so that we can get estimates of population living at this low elevation coastal zone, which we, which is, um, 
proximate to seacoast and at greater risk of seaward hazards associated with climate change. Um, I'll have one slide at the end that puts similar data um, in place to look at, say, extreme heat um, or the mortality exposure, potential mortality exposure to extreme heat. Um, just putting these in context. Um, I um, We've heard a little bit about gridded data, and I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a second. But just as background, about 10 years ago, my colleague Gordon McGranahan, the work I'm presenting is collaborative with a lot of people. I have a slide at the end recognizing them. So, um, uh, but um, my colleague Gordon McGranahan and myself um, and um, others created a data, the first low elevation coastal zone. And at that time, we estimated for the first time that roughly one in 10 persons live in a low elevation, in this low elevation coastal zone, which we defined as 10 meter contiguous to coast. And yes, we don't expect sea level rise to be at 10 meters, but um, five meters is a zone that's used even by New York City for example, uh, in its emergency planning, um, as an emer in its in um, um, emergency planning. Um, so um, we also found that most countries with any land area in that LECZ have their largest city within it. Um, that small island states and deltaic countries and their cities are were at much higher risk. And importantly, and here I'm showing the total population and the urban population that one in eight urban persons live in the LECZ with city dwellers in Africa and Asia disproportionately at risk. Um, most future population growth um, it will take place in the cities and towns of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So Juliana mentioned you know, at the start of this that the original World Population Day celebration was decades ago when the population was turning to you know, at 5 million. Um, but in fact, you know, it was only roughly in, um, in, it was in this century where we turned over to becoming a more urban and less urban planet, um, where you know 50% of the population or more lives in cities. And to date, um, less than half of the population of Asia and Africa, for example, are city dwellers. And that is where the bulk of future population growth will take place in the cities and towns of Asia and Africa. And so therefore, the fact that they're already starting off with disproportionate um, persons in this low elevation coastal zone is something we want to take pay attention to because those are the places where we expect to experience future growth. Um, so you can see that the total um, and urban fractions are very similar for uh, places outside Asia and Africa. So why do I mention this original thing? Well, I mentioned this because we when we the first time we did it, like often with these big data projects, um, including GRUMP, the Global Rural Urban Mapping Project, which was used here, data, data are evolving. There are large communities of data users. Census, censuses around the world are getting better. The US has all, long been a leader, but many international censuses are getting better. Our, the satellite data that we're using to estimate urban areas and um, even the low elevation coastal zone, which are based on digital elevation models, those are all improving over time. So we've come back to revisit this, um, but before I get to what we're doing in that revisit, let me just describe the method, This, <clears throat> which is pretty simple. It depends on the quality of the data. It combines demographic and satellite data. So here for Southern Vietnam, we see the um, small aerial units, these are <clears throat> the equivalent of census blocks uh, in for, uh, for uh, Vietnam, and these are the administrative boundaries, they're called communes there. Um, <clears throat> the red uh, polygons that we see are Grump, the Global Rural Urban Mapping Project, indicating that these places are were lit up and had an urban settlement. And then overlaying on that was the low elevation coastal zone. Now, all of these data, these data are shown in their native uh, vector format, but in fact, the population data, because it's me measured in this irregular polygons, which conform to these census, these small census enumerator areas, which have good reasons for being irregularly shaped. Um, the under and country to country, they vary in spatial resolution and so on, as well as temporal scale, but um, we transform that to this grid that you've heard about. So, um, and I was really delighted to hear both Frank and Greg refer to gridded population and Greg at the Census Bureau thinking about how the US Census maybe can think about producing uh, gridded population products. I think that's a really exciting prospect to do this, particularly as they 
um, in the US Census, the rules for privacy um, around the microdata and censuses are increasing and may impact small area estimates. Being able to create gridded population data, which can mask some of that would be fantastic. And then also having the census be producing something other than simple population counts. So what we get is population counts in a grid. It would be really great to have other attributes coming out of the census um, in gridded format. And that would make it much, much easier for downstream users to to do the kind of analysis that I'm showing here, which is think about um, what well, basically zonal statistics, as I, I'm going to show, um, in uh, when you take uh, these irregular um, polygons, like or, or an irregular satellite derived unit that it looks at an exposure, in this case, sea, uh, these seaward, the low elevation coastal zone, but you could use it for places that experience wildfires or hurricane paths, or you could use it for um, other, other environmental exposures or other kinds of geographies that are don't conform to, to, to traditional administrative boundaries. And that would be that would be mind bogglingly. I mean, that would be revolutionary. So I really hope that that happens. And I'm happy to have a side conversation at some point. If you're interested, Greg, in, in that, I would be. Um, so um, so modeling those data um, and then um, so the, in addition, the gridded data are sometimes the census when the census data are relatively coarse, there are whole, many and Frank was referring to other global data sets. Well, there are other model data sets for population um, out there, not just those that use only censuses as their inputs, but those that use modeling. They model like uh, the population to um, coastline or to um, lit areas or to roads or to other um, or um, based on slope or elevation where we know that people are unlikely to live. And so those model, there are many po model population data sets that also are used and these are particularly useful in places where there are coarse administrative areas because most people don't live there. So if you go to the Sahel, for example, um, where you know it's largely unpopulated, but people do live in the Sahel, they just live in concentrated areas. Those kind of models do really well in, the, in those areas, but those also have their limits. Um, so, and to date, the only, at the gridded population data really only have counts of population. So you can derive densities because they're spatial. But other than that, there's no other attributes. If we wanted to do a poverty metric that from these same data, we could not. For example, if we wanted to look at education globally, we could not. Um, most censuses do collect information on those kinds of characteristics, but we are not, we don't have them at for global assessments. Um, so, um, in the interest of time, let me tell you a little bit about we, what we did. I'm going to leave out most of the details, but um, there were have I mentioned that in the last 10, 15 years, there have been tremendous improvements to, um, to the way we can measure the LECZ, so which is based on digital elevation models. Those have improved a lot, and now it allows for us to distinguish between those living um, in a zero to five meter zone and those in five to 10 meter zones contiguous to coast. And this is, of course, important because people exposed to seaward hazards are more likely to be exposed if you live zero to five. Um, rather than five to 10, but then in going in the future, today's five to 10 will be next next uh, generation zero to five. Um, we have new measures of urbanization allowing for distinguishing urban areas along a continuum rather than a dichotomous urban rural. So, and as well, we can characterize the built up density of such locations. And importantly, we can also do some change over time. So we can evaluate this between 1990 and 2015 using temporally varying measures of population in urban areas previously unavailable, but the LECZ measure is still only for year 2000. And you, we could ask ourselves what would be the desired time steps, you know, when there are major storms, the coastline does change, but much more slowly than say population or urbanization. Just to give you a quick visual on this, this is what the LECZ looks like. I'm showing this for Bangkok. This is zero to five meters. This is five to 10 meters. Um, and I'm gonna go past all these other, there's um, these things. I just wanna point out that in the data, the study I'm reporting from, which I have a link to a, a preprint on it, we actually do a sensitivity analysis that examines four different data sets. And if you look quickly, you can see that they look different across. These are four different elevation data sets that we use. Um, 
Similarly, there are an array of urban concepts. The data selection um, are driven by key requirements and ability to identify population within settled areas and an ability to measure change in settled areas inside and outside the LECZ. So we ask, are the LECZs developing faster, for example, than in inland areas? And it models human settlements. We use, uh, this one uses like an impervious surface sort of um, machine learning model, and the other is using nighttime light space models. And this gives you an idea of we create three uh, some of these data sets are the, these data sets are continuous but for the ability to compare across them we create categories that are called rural quasi urban and urban centers and the urban centers are places that you would easily identify as a city rural is something that you would easily identify as rural and the quasi urban stuff are small towns villages some suburban areas exurban areas all that stuff in between and again this looks really different across these four different uh, ways of conceptualizing this um, I'll pass on this slide. And then here, looking at this for Bangkok, the red are the cities or urban centers, the orange are the quasi-urban areas, and um, and I'm not sure the rest of the area is um, uh, is uh, the rural. Um, and the urban centers with this one model that we're using um, is, you know, uses a population density criteria and a population threshold criteria together. And we inherit this from the underlying data that we're using, but this is just in this one, one of the four data sets that we use. Um, and so, um, and then as you see here, it's overlaid with the LECZ. So you can see most of Greater Bangkok is in um, at least the 10 meter LECZ along with much of the surrounding area. Um, and so, um, and we use uh, the, the population data that we will use here in this in the estimates that I'm going to show primarily are use this uh, use the census data with a reallocation to the built up area from this data set called the global human settlement layer it's available through the joint research center in ISPR Italy. And it's a data set called GHS pop and it reallocates population to those built up areas, so it starts with census at its core backbone and reallocates it so that it's not um, so that it's more concentrated there's some issues with doing that but on average it's you you know we get then the tails of the two possible um x estimates and so finally population data here we see um the population data is the in the orange to red hues here for the same greater bangkok area and we see this overlaid with the five and ten meter lecc um and so um just in the interest of, and the interest of time, again, four different data sets are possible here. So we have, uh, and and this is the one that uses the census data. So the census units are coarser for um, Thailand than they are for the United States. So in that case, you know, some of these model inputs might improve the estimation. Um, and I, it's important to know that when using these population models, very rarely do we actually have, um, a, uh, do we have an ability to cross reference and cross validate these at the finest scale, because um, if we had those data, we wouldn't need to model so much. Um, so with that in mind, um, or what is urban? Well, um, measurement matters. This is a, our, uh, we confirm our original findings that um, that the new estimates still place roughly 10% of the global population in the LECZ, but it also places uh, more urban residents in it. So here we see 14% of the urban population by our new estimates um, are in urban centers and a near, roughly another 10% of these quasi-urban centers. Um, and that's really important because those are the areas that may be experiencing a lot of change. They're either converting themselves to urban areas or in through in situ urbanization or people are moving from those areas into other um, in, into urban centers. So the population of these quasi urban and um, centers in rural areas, it's evenly split pretty much across the zero to five meters. But if you live in a big city, you're more likely to live um, outside the highest risk zone, but still lots and lots, 10% of urban dwellers, 9% of urban dwellers live in the five to 10 meter portion of the LECZ globally. Okay, so um, moving on, the distribution of um, land and um, of population and land area, what's, real, what's important is that 61% of the population of the LECZ lives in urban centers as compared to 47 beyond it. Slightly more than half of those live in that five to 10 meter zone. And then 12% of the land of the LECZ is urban or quasi-urban areas as, as compared to 2% of land beyond the LECZ. So if you're 
these areas, the coastal zone is disproportionately urban. Sea level rise is an urban problem. It will be, and if it isn't now, it will be. Uh, so cities need to be preparing their climate strategies, resilience strategies, mitigation strategies, emergency planning strategies, all of them will have to be taking into account the urban nature of the LECC. So, um, okay, so, um, now, oh, and importantly, quasi-urban areas occupy more land and have more people in than urban do everywhere. So we don't want to dismiss them. Like we don't want to only look at big cities because the totality of these middle-sized places, these places that are not urban nor rural or sort of are maybe more urban than they are rural suburbs and um, small towns on total, they occupy much more land. And in fact, as you can see, they're the yellow ones here. And um, that's the population. Here's the land. And um, and so that's important um, as well. And, and they are home to lots and lots of people. Okay, uh, population density in 1990 in the LECZ was nearly six times more densely settled than land outside the LECZ, but with population growth faster in the LECZ, densities in 2015 were close to 320 persons per square kilometer in the LECZ versus 54 persons outside of it. Uh, the likely causes here are probably that the LECZ's disproportionate urban nature to begin with, cities are coastal, coastal areas have been home to ports and so forth, had riverine transport, you know, combined with urban population growth and the in-situ urbanization and expansion of urban land. So though this sometimes can lower densities in such locations as well. So I, um, I should pay attention to time. I should wrap up soon. So I wanna just point out that there's a sense, I'm gonna not go through most of the rest of these slides though. <clears throat> the sensitivity analysis data choices can lead to large differences in estimates of population exposure to potential sea level rise and coastal hazards. Users really need if you're, um, to consider fitness of use for a respective case and data choices matter. So the next set of slides just tell you this is they, why they matter. This is just differences in elevation. These are differences in population. And importantly, the estimates are much, the estimates uh, our estimates of population in the LECZ are much more sensitive to the choice of the LECZ, of the DEM we use to measure the LECZ than to the choice of the population data set. And the urban continuum, though we see differences by them, and that settlement estimates are highly sensitive to the data choice, change over time, urban areas have experienced the greatest increase in population. Urban areas within the LECZ have experienced, have grown even faster. And this is true regardless of which of your data choices. So the rates may be a little different, but the over these trends are true regardless of which urban construct you use and which population data set you use for it. So. Um, and confirming our notion that this um, that these urban areas are growing faster in the LECZ. This is where a preprint of this study is found. Um, so, but despite the major differences, every source we evaluate shows the disproportionately urban nature and that urban of the LECZ and that urban populations in the LECZ is growing at a rate faster than what we see outside of it. Um, I, point, I wanna point out that deltaic, this divides it up into continents. And here we see that, um, uh, the areas that are growing fastest are in Asia and that cities are at risk everywhere, but especially in Asia, zero to five meter LECZ. And this includes many large cities like the example I started with Bangkok, but also Dhaka, Calcutta, Saigon, Greater Ho Chi Minh City. <clears throat> They're all situated in deltas. And this is where the value of using say, gridded population data that are um, devoid of the boundaries in which they come from are really valuable because they lend themselves really nicely to a mix and match strategy because we can then start asking how much of the LECZ is in deltas and roughly of the 815 million persons residing in the LECZ, more than, slightly more than a third of them live in this delta region. We don't have delta statistics for social data, right? The a delta is a geographic area. So, and then of the respective proportions in the zero to five is on the rise. That, and so that's important. In the interest of time, I won't go through these, these slides which show change in deltaic areas versus LECZ and then the combination of them, as well as the change in the built-up area. But what's, um, what's important is that um, 
that and there's more analysis underway but the the data choices matter and understanding settlement density and form may really distort some of the results so there's still more improvements to be made in how we under like in the because urban areas a lot of these estimates are based on digital elevation models and in the larger a city gets the harder it is to actually get the elevation of the city some of that might be falsely um uh, false uh, readings from buildings, for example. So that's, uh, there was a lot of attention paid to like a tree height bias in early rounds of fixing it in rural areas. And maybe now this is giving us some cause to pay closer attention to urban areas. So to finish, who's at risk globally? New improved data products allow for refined understanding who's at risk of seaweed hazards, quasi and uh, urban and quasi urban residents and those living in deltaic areas are disproportionately at risk. Much greater attention to this urban continuum, particularly in deltas and particularly those quasi urban areas. Population growth rates are highest in the urban areas of the LECZ, but with growth rates of with higher growth rates of um, population in the higher risk zone. So we have to sort of really understand what's going on in that zero to five zone. But the causes of urban growth on this celebration of population data, uh, of population day are really, they remain unanswered. We don't know if this is land expansion of existing cities, the emergence of new urban places. We don't know if the, the role of migration, most of which would be internal rather than international versus natural increased fertility, net of mortality. Those are still really big unknowns and that's really important. And that's largely because we don't have data at this scale that would allow us to evaluate those differences. So, but the answers to that would really assist in climate adaptation for certain. Um, I'm going to, these are US examples, but in the interest of time, not go through them. And finally, the same sort of data approaches can be used. These are extreme heat days from the last 30 years. This is, um, and then over here is a mortality response. So instead of, pop, it's both population and CDC data on uh, heat, heat coded mortality. And uh, these kind of data can be used to forecast future heat, but this tells us where, uh, you know, person days exposure to you know, heat deaths across the United States. And uh, notably, you see um, places like, yes, along here where, um, but you also see parts that are not in the hottest parts of the country where the uh, heat days are very high, but we see the Pacific Northwest, we see the Northeast, we see these moderate temperate climates like in uh, the Midwest and the um, this is somewhere in Missouri, I believe. So uh, areas where there's not ubiquitous air conditioning and so forth. So these kinds of uh, same kinds of data sets can be mixed and matched to, to get an analysis like this as well. And with that, um, I, as I mentioned, there's a lot of people involved. I'm happy to take any, um, you know, people are free to be in touch with me. A uh, large study involved a lot of colleagues and students and so forth. Thank you.